right, everybody, we are continuing our series in first, on 1 first Peter, in 1 Peter, and it's been quite some time since we've been going through it, and that's an important book of the Bible, and uh, I just want to encourage you to read it for yourself, 1 Peter. We have about two weeks left in it, and, uh, and then we're going to be doing a new series, which I'm really excited about, but I want to encourage you to get into the Bible, and this is what we do. We like going through uh, books of the Bible together, reading line by line, verse by verse, and that's what we've been doing through this series. And this series is all about suffering and how to handle it. But before we do that, I want to mention a few things that's going on. Today at 1 o'clock, we have something called Grove Track. You see, I I'm telling you right now, it's so great to go to church, but it's great to be a part of the body, get involved with what's going on here. And so today at 1 o'clock, I'm teaching a class with lunch and child care. We'll even wash your car. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, actually. So we'll be having that at 1 o'clock. goes 1 to 2, and you get to hear about the story of the church, how it began, what we believe, what we don't believe. You can ask any question you want, and there's absolutely no pressure at all. But it will give you a good idea what it's about. So I get to share the story of Cornerstone, the story of what God is doing right here right now. That's today at 1 o'clock. Also, this week, Wednesday, we have our first Wednesday. Every month, the first Wednesday. Wednesday of the month, we get together and we have a more of an extended time of worship and prayer. Goes from seven to eight. Really want to encourage you to come out to that. It's always an amazing and refreshing time. We can't always do these things on a Sunday morning because we have to keep a schedule. But on Wednesday night, it's more open and uh, more individual. And it's a great time. Really want to encourage you about that. And then finally, coming up at the end of the month. We have something called 21 Days of Prayer. And that is going to be, I'm looking at my calendar here real quick, everybody. It's going to start the 29th of August. And so what it is, we spend 21 days praying and fasting, pretty much praying. We're going to gather here 6.30 a.m. Monday through Friday. We're going to live stream it as well. And what we're going to do is calibrate and get ready for the new season. Because a lot of us have been scattered through the summer. We want to get focused. We want to pray first. And so it's really an important time. And I'm, I'm believing God for great things this 21 days. So put that on your calendar and get ready for that, okay? So we are in our series called First Peter, Unshakable. How to be unshakable in shakable times. And today, we're going to talk about suffer up. I think you've heard surfer up, surfs up, suffer up. What is that supposed to mean? Well, it's important for us to learn how to deal with suffering. And, and, and First Peter has been all about that. Peter wrote this in the 50s. We've been talking about it week in and week out, right? And, and, and the church is beginning to have persecution. Nero is coming into power. And shortly after this book is written, Christians will experience the greatest persecution they ever, ever did. I mean, Nero was the kind of guy that would like Christians on a pole and light them for his games. He would throw Christians to the lions. He would take a horse and tie your four limbs and have the horses go different directions. This was coming. At the point of this writing of this book, it wasn't there yet. And so Peter is dealing with how do you become unshakable in a shakable world? How can you and I be firm, right? And so we've been going through that. So today, I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. But I first want to ask you a question. Can you imagine? We all have dreams, right? If you could think of your best day. Imagine, if you will, all your life, you, you've been wanting to graduate college. You, you wanted to get that degree. Maybe you want to become a doctor. And now you're 32 years old. You went through medical school. You went through your residency. You graduated. You, you got that great first job. I mean, a lot of money. They're paying off your college debt. You just got married. You got a beautiful house. You got a BMW M5. You get all these wonderful things. Things are going awesome. Um, your kids are behaving. Even your cat's listening to you. I mean, it's good. You're just having an amazing, like, I can't believe it's just, I'm going to just pinch myself. And, and you open the Bible and you appreciate it. You feel God's presence. It's like, it just does not get any better than this. Or how about this? 
Maybe you, you're a high school student and you've been working hard and, and you're not quite sure. You want to go to that university. You want to go to that college. Or maybe you want to get that, that landing job. Maybe you want to get in a, a union so you can get a good union benefits. And you've worked hard and, and, you, grad, and you did that. You went through the union and now you're got, you had this amazing salary. You had this amazing person you married. And things are going great. You got into the college you wanted. Full ride. And everyone loves you, and your parents buy you a brand new BMW M5 <laughs> and pay for the insurance. And it's amazing. Everything is going great. You look good. Maybe you were going bald like me, and your hair grew back. I mean, everything <laughs> is going amazing. I mean, nothing. I'm like, I'm in this season of my life. God's blessing me. I always heard that God blesses me. I always heard that if I give my life to Jesus, it's just going to get better and better and better. Right? And then you find out, wait a minute here. It all goes crashing down. What happens if that medical degree, you've got a malpractice suit and you lose your medical what happens if your spouse says, I want nothing to do with you anymore? What happens if you, you lose that college degree? What happens if you get sick? What happens when everything that you dreamed of falls apart? Then what? Did God leave me? Well, Peter understood this very well because Jesus taught them a lesson. And I wanted to start off with this. Jesus, for three and a half years, taught his disciples. They would follow him around, and he would lay hands on the sick. He would do incredible things, raise the dead, multiply wine, uh, uh, multiply bread. I mean, he did incredible, incredible things. And so the disciples are watching him. And finally, he goes, hey, guys, tell you what. You're going to do the stuff I'm doing. Okay, Jesus. No, now you are. What? Yeah. You 70. He had 70 disciples. He had 12. He had 120. But these were the 70, kind of the, the bigger group. He says, I'm going to send you out. I want you to go out and preach. I want you to tell people to give their life to Christ, or me, <laughs> to God, get right with God, lay hands on the sick. They're going to recover, cast out demons. Like, who, me? So guess what happens? They're watching Jesus. They go out. And they're like, there's a sick person here. In Jesus' name be healed. Boom, the person gets up and what? Someplace, you go someplace else, you pray for someone, they, they get healed. Demons are cast out, right? I mean, whoa, this is amazing. Everything I'm doing is success. I am doing what Jesus said I could do. This is fantastic. This is awesome. Jesus has come, and we're going to be the new reigning kingdom. We're going to take over the Roman Empire. I mean, look what's happening. Everything is awesome. One of my favorite songs from the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. I mean, everything is going magnificently. They come back to Jesus after their tour. We're not quite sure how long it was, but probably at least maybe a month, because they had to travel around. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But some time passed by. They come back, and Jesus says the following. Then the 70 return with what? They're hanging. Yeah, Joy. Hey, man, this is exactly like they told me when I gave my life to Christ. It's all going to be great, right? Joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So it's like, Jesus, yeah, you got this thing down. And we go on and on and on. Behold, he says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. We're on a winning team. We're going to the World Series of, of Christiany, right? Christianity, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right, we're the winning team. We are the champions of the world. They sang it before Queen wrote it. I mean, that's what was going on. It's a joke. Okay, never mind. So let's move on. Then he stops them. He says, I, I know you're excited, but nevertheless, guys, hey, 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 guys, guys, guys. Oh, over here, look, look, look. Look, look, yeah, Jesus said, hold on, hold on. I know that's great. But I want to help you calibrate your life. This is what he says. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Well, Jesus, we just told us to do this. Why are you stopping the party for? No, don't rejoice that, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather hilariously rejoice, uh, exuberance, because your names are written in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm excited for what happened to you. But you can't base your happiness based upon circumstantial evidence. 
You, you can re- appreciate it. You can thank God for that new job. You can thank God for that, that, that child. You can thank God for that whatever you're going through. But, but don't base it. Or you can thank God for a church that's doing well before they tell you to close down. Uh, I mean, you can thank God for tremendous things. But don't base your happiness and your rejoicing on circumstantial evidence, circumstances. Why would he say such a thing? Because Jesus knew that out of those 70, and especially those 12, all of them would be martyred except one, John, who the uh, church tradition says he was boiled in oil. Probably worse. And, and he knew that there were going to be times where the prison doors would not open. There would be times, like the Apostle Paul says, I asked God three times, the sword in my flesh, and the floor is still there. What's going to happen when Paul leaves Demas sick, and he prays for Demas, and Demas doesn't get better? What happens when everything you thought was supposed to happen doesn't happen? What happens when it all comes crashing down? Jesus is setting his disciples up to calibrate themselves, not to rejoice in circumstances, but rejoice in who they are in heaven. Now listen, if you're going to build a house, you need a good foundation. If you're building upon how things are going, good luck, everybody. What you're doing is you're building on faulty foundation. What we have to do is we have to build our hope and our joy on who we are in Christ Jesus. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've um, sacrificed your life to him, said, God, I'm giving you everything, then what you do is you build upon the foundation that cannot be shaken. Like I told you before, the NC Hammer 317 says, you can't touch this. Why? Because Jesus did it for us. You stand on that. Okay? No matter what happens. Now, when good things take place, you still rejoice, but you build that rejoicing on your position in Christ in heaven. Then you build that structure. So if this structure goes down, you still got this. Are you, are you, are you tracking with me today? One of the most important things. Yeah, come on. Yes. So, one of the things I say all the time here at Cornerstone Church, I coined the phrase, I guess I did, so... I'm going to get royalties from it. I'm just kidding. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. If you want to go ahead and text that or Instagram, go ahead after the service. But the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you right now, we've been through some things in our church, in our staff, some difficult days, okay? Some real difficult days recently was one of the people in our church. Their mother died way before her time from COVID in Colombia. And we prayed. You know, it, and all last week I had a hard time. I'm like, God, I, I, all week I was, I was mourning for what took place. But we have to rejoice in hope. And, and, and you may not know why this is happening. And so the best days are always ahead. And I've told people in the hospice on their last breath, they're going to die that day. I said, you know, the best days are ahead for you in Christ Jesus. Why? This is temporary. We must understand that. So I want to tell you to suffer up. Suffer up. You're going to suffer. But suffer up to God. Don't suffer in yourself, but suffer up to God. And and we're going to go right now into the passage of Scripture now. Peter once again talks about suffering. This is the third time in the book of 1 Peter. He goes this. I'm going to to read the whole chapter. I'm going to go back and talk about it, okay? Here we go. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. But let not... But let none of you suffer as murderer or a thief or evildoer or as a meddler... Interesting, they they combine those two with murderers. That's beside the point. Yet if anyone suffers as as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify or her glorify in that name. For For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful creator while doing good. Now, those are some very sobering verses, right? Well, we're going to look through them today, okay? First thing we have to understand is this. What not to do when you're suffering? Don't be surprised. It's going to happen. No, but don't be a pessimist. Don't be an Eeyore. Well, I guess, you know, Charlie Brown. Or not Charlie Brown. Uh, Winnie, it's just going to be bad. And so, you know, no, I'm not talking about that. We don't set ourselves for failure. But when it happens, don't be surprised. You don't need to focus on it. Focus on what's good. Don't be surprised. You know, beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery, we're going to get to that in a few moments, that means a lot of heat and difficulty, fiery trial when it comes. Don't be surprised. Jesus said it. In this world, you're going to have what? That's right. But, but rejoice, I've overcome. So don't be surprised. Just because you gave your life to Jesus does not mean you have a hall pass from all suffering. So do, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange happened to you. In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul gives us another promise that Jesus told us. Yes, and all, look at your neighbor and say, you're an all. Okay. How dare you say that? Okay. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, this is about persecution. 80% of the world, according to the Human Rights um, Foundation, says 80% of the suffering in the world from religious is against Christians. I'm hearing stories of people being round up and shot. Number one place in the world for pers Christian persecution is North Korea. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but if I told you, you wouldn't be, you'd be flabbergasted. The amount of suffering, the beheadings, all these things that are going around in the world. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In Mark 10, 29, this is what Jesus says, and listen to this. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands. Now, this is not saying that you leave your family because you don't like them. I'm talking about if you're being persecuted for serving God, okay? For my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive what? A hundredfold, and this blows me away, a hundredfold now? Really? Yeah. In this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come. So what he's saying is, listen, you, you see, everybody, it's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. And so if you have the peace of God inside of you, it doesn't make a difference what happens on the outside. And that's what we have to understand. The climate of heaven we need to cultivate. That's why we come to church. That's why it says, do not forsake the gathering together. That's why I tell you, it's good to get back in the room, to worship together, to cultivate that faith, to help each other. The Bible says, pray for one another, right? We're called to do that. So what do we have to do? We're going to have it now, a hundredfold now, that you're gonna, you can overcome your circumstances. They don't have to control you. But a hundredfold now in eternal life. I mean, listen, when you know where you're going, and the best days are ahead. That's a blessing. So many of the people in the world are anxious. They don't know what's ahead. They don't know what's going to happen when you die. We know who we are in Christ. That's part of the hundredfold. Now back to 1 Peter again. 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. What to do when suffering? Rejoice. What? Come on. Yeah, rejoice. Yeah, you rejoice. You can rejoice in pain. The Apostle Paul says, struck down but not destroyed. Always giving grace to God. So you can rejoice in that. It doesn't mean you're not dealing with reality. But you can rejoice in pain. You can say, Father, I'm, I'm going through a hard, thank you, God, that the best is ahead. You see, happiness is based on happenstance. Joy is based on a position of who you are. If you base your life upon circumstances, your happiness is like this, but joy is straight because joy is a future fact not yet realized. But rejoice in so far you share Christ's sufferings. Paul says, I want to know Christ." in the joy of his salvation and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now listen, everybody, I don't want to put that in my dashboard. I don't want to suffer like anyone else. I don't want to suffer. And I don't stand up here saying, hey, I have it together. I don't. This is very humbling for me. And I don't want to talk about suffering so much, but guess what? It's in the Bible. So as we're going through the book of the Bible, that's why I like going through a book of the Bible. It makes you talk about things that pastors don't want to talk about. It's hard to grow a church talk about suffering. Wait, where you go? What's happening? What do you learn in church? How to suffer? 
How to have a supper? No. How to suffer? No, thank you. Right? I mean, who wants to hear about that? But guess what? Suffering is a part of life, and we better learn how to deal with it in the proper, proper way. So, as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And so it's about God. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. And since he overcame the world, we overcome. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. You see, in this you rejoice. We go back to 1 Peter in the beginning of the book. He talked about this. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, say a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith. The word test in the Greek there can be used in two different ways, an actual test and another way for purifying. The context is quite clear. It's about purifying. More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. How many of you felt like you went through fire last year? Whew. Yeah, right? May be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what they do? And in order to, to take gold, what they would do is they would melt gold and precious metal. And as they melt it, this is what happens is the impurities begin to rise to the top. However, it cannot happen until there's a fiery trial. You see, God often puts natural laws of nature often are a sermon for us to learn. And I believe, it, I believe he does that on purpose. And so in the Bible, it talks about that, that you take the dross and you melt, you would melt the metal and take off the stuff until you see reflection. And so let the fire refine you so that God can see his reflection in your life. You see, I have dross. I had dross last night. I got a little spat with my wife. I was being stupid, right? The Lord's like, you got some more dross. It was over nothing, by the way. Honey, I'm sorry for that. Can I just be real with you? You, you want some fake pastor up here, everybody, that has it all together? I'm just not that kind of guy. I'm real. I, I, I struggle like the rest of you guys. But guess what? We ask for forgiveness. We move on. And the dross keeps coming up. Praise the Lord. I had to take it off. Especially happens when you're late at night, you're tired, right? I'm going to take it off. And, and you know what? And I take responsibility because I'm the high priest of the house. Hello. Okay, for another time. So what has to happen is you want to see, God wants to see his face in you. So he'll let the fire come. Now, he doesn't always cause these things, but he uses it for his glory and his good. And so that's what fire can do. Let fire make you better, not bitter. That's what we want to be able to do. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. What? Yeah. Uh, because the spirit of glory and the God rests upon you. Let's be honest, everybody. We think we have persecution. We don't know what we're talking about. Compared to other places of the world, we have it pretty darn good. It's starting to rise, by the way. And that's a topic for another time. Now, how to suffer up and rejoice in sufferings? Future glory of heaven. That's what we have to focus on, the future glory of heaven. The second thing is that we are to present blessings, that we thank God for the present blessings, that we have his presence, that he's with us, that he says he'll never leave us. And so even though I don't feel like he's with me, he's with me. And finally, using it for refinement and, and let the suffering make you better. I, I wish I could tell you that my greatest lessons happened when things went well. They didn't. My greatest lessons came in my biggest pain. I wish there was another way, but it, you know, that refinement... Tim Keller, who's a wonderful pastor, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, and now is, uh, he retired from that. He has cancer, pancreatic cancer, which is not a good cancer to get. And he said, I've never been closer to God than I am now. He said, it's been a gift, not the cancer, but the revelation of what really matters in life. I taught about it. I preached about it. But now, it's not here. It's here. Listen, we don't want to look for suffering for suffering's sake, but we can use it for refinement. You see, our suffering can either make us bitter or better. Bitter or better. You know, and the only difference between bitter and better is I. You see, I means all about me, 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 
right? I, I, I. But when we have to get rid of the I and put an E, and an E equals eternity. We need to get from being bitter to better. I'm going to get better, not bitter. Can you say that? I'm going to get better, not bitter. One more time. I'm going to get better, not bitter. That's a choice that you have to make. You have a choice, and I have a choice. Is this going to tear me apart, or is this going to make me better? I choose to focus. I'm going to get the I out of bitter, and I'm going to put an E for eternity. I'm going to become better. And you know it's not easy. That's why we need each other. That's why we have small groups coming in the fall. We need to encourage. Hey, hey, don't do that. We need to encourage each other. As a team going together. You see, we must, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. The best days are always ahead. So we move on in the verse here. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, by the way, that happens, right? You are blessed. Because the spirit of the glory and God rests upon you. See, when you suffer, God is with you. Okay, but let none of your suffer as a murderer. Okay, and you say, all right, a murderer or a thief, stealing, not paying your taxes. Oh, yep, that's stealing, everybody. Taking things at work that don't belong to you, clocking in, changing your time clock, saying you were there when you weren't there, strobing the internet when you should be working. That's stealing, everybody. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Okay, now I'm meddling. Okay, and by the way, we, we all struggle with that at times, right? So surfer and murderer, a thief, or an evildoer. Or how about this one? Or a meddler. No, that doesn't mean an Olympic athlete that gets medals, no. Meddle means I'm getting involved with your business and getting involved with things that are none of my business and sharing with other people and causing strife. That's considered evil. In the church, we like to pick on the, on the murdering and all that other stuff, but we don't talk about meddling. Don't be meddling in each other's business. What? What are you supposed to do instead? Here to what? But none of you suffer as a result of that. You know what happens when you meddle? You have broken relationships. People can't trust you anymore. We don't want to do that. So what not to do when you're suffering? Don't be surprised. Don't deserve your suffering from others or God. Don't deserve it. it, it work hard, right? Do, do the right thing. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him or her glorify God in that name. You don't need to be ashamed, but you can glorify God in that name. So what not to do? do not be surprised. Don't deserve your suffering, right? When you, do, when you suffer, make sure you're suffering because you're doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. And don't be ashamed of being a Christ follower. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what? Everyone's fine if you love God. But we need to start saying, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I serve Jesus. And I am not ashamed to pray in a restaurant. I am not ashamed to share my faith. Amen? All two of you, praise the Lord. <laughs> now, we get to some fun stuff. Here we go. Verse, uh, 1 Peter 4, 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. What? Judgment? Ah. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? I believe God allows his church first to go through a refinement before he brings the fire on the rest of society. Why? Because the world needs the church to be holy and pure. God will allow stuff. And my friends, COVID, this whole thing, this last year, it should make us better and ready to bless the world. Not fight against each other over silliness. Let's let this stuff make us better. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? You know what, everybody? You just serve God. Let God deal with the other people. Leave it into God, okay? You know what it says in the book of Romans? Romans chapter 1 talks about God's wrath coming upon society and how it's all gonna, God's going to judge them. Paul, the apostle Paul Strong read, read me to the crowd. Yeah, those sinners. And then he flips the page and he goes, he says this. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man or woman. Every one of you who judges for, this, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same very things. Are we criticizing people for doing the very same thing that we're doing? So what do we do? 
we daily choose to commit to God. Rejoice, focus on eternity and God's justice. God will work it out. I am not God. I don't have to make sure everyone pays. The guy cuts you off, let God deal with him at the next traffic stop. All right? So, and daily choose to commit to God and to do what is right even when wrong. Two wrongs never make a right. Let, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Listen, God got this, everybody. Control what you can control, what you cannot control. Give to God. And what you can control, give to God. But, you know, this is the, this is the whole part here. The serenity prayer. Lord, help me to, to, to change what I can change and what I can't to know the difference, right? I'm paraphrasing. Okay, so therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. God will take care of it. I want to just close with this. For this is the light momentary affliction in preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I'm going to ask if my dear, my new friend would come up real quick. Say hi to my new friend, Matthew Brown. Thank you, Matthew Brown. All right, now what is this? I want to just help you here. Now watch what happens here. Goes down, comes back up, right? It keeps coming back up. No matter how hard you hit it, comes back. Well, how does that happen? You know why it happens? There's a weight in the bottom of this. In the bottom of the cylinder, there's a weight. And that weight brings it back up. And so when you see this, for this light momentary infliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Do you have that eternal weight of glory in the, in the soul of who you are? Is it in your spirit? We have to practice. We have to remember the best days are ahead. The best days are ahead. I'm going to be with Christ forever and ever and ever. And I may get hit. She may have left me. I may have lost my job. I may have cancer, right? But I'm going to get back up because I have the eternal glory of God. I have the weight of his glory. Do you have the weight of his glory in your life? Because we all get backed around. We all get slapped around. But get back up. Because I have the eternal weight of glory. Do you have the eternal weight of glory in your life right now? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I, I, Lord, all of us today, myself, Lord, understand that suffering is a part of life. But Father, we also want to make sure that we have that eternal weight of glory in us. And the only way we can have that eternal weight of glory, oh God, is we have to give our lives to you. In Jesus' name. And every head bowed and every eye closed. This is a holy moment. Please don't move around and stir around. And those at home as well. Have you given your life to Jesus? Do you, have that, do you have that eternal weight of glory in you? Do you know what's going to happen when you die that you'll be with heaven? To be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. Remember, God doesn't just save us for heaven. He saves us for the earth. That you can experience the joy of God now and that you can make a difference now. But have you sacrificed your life to Jesus? Jesus does not tell us just to believe in him because even the devil believes in him more than we do. But what Christ asks us to do is put our faith and trust in him. You see, Jesus came because he loved you. The Bible says he came to this earth. He went on the cross to pay for a debt you could not pay. You could spend the rest of your life trying to get it together. You never will get it together. No one will. But Jesus got it together for you. He took all of the sins of the world upon himself. And he placed his, his holiness and his righteousness and the acceptance upon you. It's through Jesus Christ that we can go straight to God, have eternal life, and experience his presence now. You don't have to get your act together because none of us can, but what you have to get is your surrender together. Maybe you're in the process and you want more evidence and you're so welcome to, I went through a period of my life too, it took me a while to, to come to terms with it, but maybe right now you're ready. You don't have to have all the answers. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. 
I'm going to repeat, with, uh, repeat after me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, right, just go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to hand my life over to you. Take my life. Thank you for forgiving me, and thank you, I am now your responsibility. I am a child of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <laughs>